morning. How are you guys Good doing morning, this morning? Oscar. We're doing well, but where's the coffee, Oscar? I had to leave my mate down there because I thought, man, <laughs> this director, uh, look at, I'm like, I can't not navigate through here. It's like, okay, there you yeah, go. Hold I, on. I, Let I me hold on. Hold on. Look. Look. I, I don't can't. even this have like one. Weird. You're falling apart, Oscar. That's the problem. The good thing about these chairs is that you feel like you're the director, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We should have one of these in every director's um, mm -hmm. office, cut, I think. Cut, cut, cut. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anyways, let's just dig, dig right. Uh, how did you guys meet each other? Yeah. Uh, well, we and how we, we lived together married? in the dorm oh, at gosh. UCSD. He UC always San says Diego. like lived together in like in separate dorms, right? In no, same dorm. in the same dorm. Same dorms, different rooms. Oh wow, that was in those. We days. met my freshman year, his sophomore year at UC San Diego. Oh yeah, yeah. And my girlfriend pointed when we we our whole floor got together, and my girlfriend said, "Look at that guy over there," wow. and pointed right at Tom. I said, yeah, but look at the guy next to him. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh Dr. Oh, man, what a blow. You got Zap right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you know. Yeah, but look who got the girl. Yes, That's right. yeah, yeah, I can see. There you go. Wonderful. And I know that, um, um, so you went on, you studied, you completed your degrees. It was the same at UC San Diego, or where did you complete your degrees? Oh, at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, and then University of Toronto for... A doctoral degree in cool. New and Testament. Yeah. Yeah. And how about family? Tell us a little bit about your family. There are five of us. We have three children. Our oldest, Chris, is 34. He works in LA at Riot Gaming Company. Um, our middle son, Joel, is married. He's in Mobile, Alabama. And then our daughter, Amanda, is up in Seattle, Washington, just finished um, getting her license to become a, a MFT. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. And who gets up earlier, you or, or? Oh, we get up about the same time. Ah, that's a good question yeah. right there. Yeah. 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 That's but a he good will never answer, get up actually. until I get up, unfortunately. Um, tell us, how did you become involved in missions work? Because you guys have been um, in the mission field, and, and you have a lot of experience in the mission field. And, and let's just dig right into that. Uh, well, it was interesting because... We had always believed in missions, and we'd even talked about theoretically, you know, about Very theoretically. Doing yeah, doing that at some point, maybe teaching overseas or something of that nature. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were in the middle of a pastoral ministry. We had three small kids, and so, you know, things get put on the back burner. But about 1992, uh, the Lord started working first in my heart and then in our uh, together uh, to really call us in a very clear way to Indonesia, where okay. we served for 15 years. And uh, you it, said 15, yeah, right? Indonesia, yeah. Ada orang Indonesia di sini? Ada ya. No? Kami tahu. Oh, beberapa mungkin. Okay. So we Let were, me translate. We were there, Anybody from we were there 15, 15 years. You like that? Uh, huh? And served, and uh, the Lord blessed those times. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was just kind of a very clear call. It came down to obedience or disobedience. And what were you guys doing there, um, Katie? What, what was your work? Well, we went to, to Indonesia for Tom to teach at the Evangelical Theological Seminary of Indonesia, which is in Jogja. Um, it's a, a seminary founded by a man named Chris Marantika, and each of the students has to basically win to the Lord and baptize 15 people before they can graduate from seminary. Oh, wow. This is in the largest Muslim-dominated nation in the world. So Tom was very excited about working with this group. Um, so he was teaching for the first few years, and I was actually teaching missionary kids. Um, I started with kindergarten. Then I got promoted to the seventh grade, which was smarter. <laughs> probably a really good thing. Yeah, wow. Uh, did, did you say that uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world? Can right. you translate that in numbers for us? Well, it's the fourth most populous nation after the U.S. I think, I'm not sure the exact population at this point, but it's... 85% uh, Muslim. Muslim. Wow, yeah, it's, uh, it's very large. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there in the context of your work, um, how did healing um, prayer uh, become uh, part of your ministry? Can you share with us a little bit about what is healing prayer? And if you saw it in that context, um, 
Let me, let me give a little background. Yeah, give a little background. On so the first thing we realized when we got to Indonesia is that we were just not in Kansas anymore. We were surrounded by people, <laughs> we're surrounded by people who were very deeply involved with the occult. In addition, um, we saw a lot of abuse taking place. Children don't always have an easy time growing up there. There's a lot of verbal and physical abuse as well as um, a lot of sexual abuse. And so what we began to see in Tom, especially because he was involved every day at the seminary, was that these young people who came to the seminary often just had hearts on fire to serve the Lord. You have to be really committed in a country where everybody is against you, basically, right? So they had a real fire to serve the Lord, but they just had a terrible time moving forward. And so you begin asking why, what is, what is holding them back? What's preventing them from really reaching their potential in Christ? And we began to see that it was because of those two things. One was the occult activity. So many students, for instance, would come to seminary with an amulet that their parents had given them uh -huh. to keep them safe. Um, or they would come having been taken to the shaman for healing time after time because there wasn't really a doctor in their village. No. Those kinds of things. Or dedicated to spirits when wow. they were younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we saw that side of it. But we also saw people who were just um, devastated in terms of emotional and, and, and mental spiritual health. Uh, many of the students who came to us came from Muslim families where they were then rejected by their families. Many of them, um, you know, threatened with death, that kind of thing. So that was what opened the door to asking the questions of what do we do about this, Lord? How do you want to meet this need? Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Okay. So we have uh, students, they're coming, they're preparing themselves. They got this background um, that is very difficult, but they also got Inner, inner situations, traumatic mm -hmm. situations. How will, how will you define um, inner, inner healing, mm -hmm. Tom? You know, we've, we have three kids, and I was there present when all of them were born. And one thing I can tell you is that the person who did the hard work is sitting right here next to me. <laughs> we had a doctor present, uh, and she helped uh, a little bit, you know, help the find, okay, is this going well? Where are we in the process? And those kinds of things. It helped facilitate it a bit. But uh, really her role was quite limited because these were all normal, very healthy uh, deliveries. So I, I observed that, and we kind of like to use that, uh, that image uh, when we think about inner healing because we're really... Uh, sort of like midwives in the process or a doctor that's that's helping at a birth because we um, we simply help the per help introduce the person who's usually a Christian to uh, Christ they, they already know him as Savior but we introduce them to him as the healer uh, the wonderful counselor who counsels not only the nation Israel but but uh, counsels his his people today and so we bring, help them to ex, uh, express what is, is going on in their heart. Uh, we listen to their life story. It's usually a, a process. Uh, and then we begin to pray and take these things to the Lord. And we look at, especially at two, thing, two aspects of, of the situation. One is um, the wounds, the, the, the deep hurts and traumas and things that they've experienced. And we allow the Holy Spirit to begin to move in those uh, uh, traumas and those wounds and bring healing. Uh, at the same time, uh, we ask that He show us how they responded to it. And, and often when we've been hurt, we take away certain beliefs from that experience. And often those are not healthy beliefs, not true beliefs. They're, they're deceptions, really, when we look at Scripture. <laughs> And we develop defensive responses, and we, um, you know, can can be full of bitterness, maybe, uh, toward that person or even the group that they represent to us. And so we we ask the Lord to help us understand those things, and then we begin to to move and and work through those as well. And it isn't just a, a counts a tr like traditional counseling where the only people in the room are the the, per the person. Uh, and the counselee, the the client and the and the uh, sorry the count the the client and the and the and the therapist or the psychologist, but we're we're bringing these things to the Lord, and then as they're trying to respond to what the Lord is showing them, we're asking the Lord to help them and and uh, 
uh, to work in those situations. So there's a lot of prayer. There's a lot of waiting before the Lord, allowing Him to show us things. Um, some, when we use the term inner healing, Oscar, we have to be really careful, I think, because it can mean almost anything in today's right. world. Uh, and it's often uh, episodic, meaning, you know, at the end of a service, someone gets prayed for uh, uh, for a few minutes about something, or they get a session here or there. Uh, but we usually walk through with a person through that process of healing over a period of time and meet with them regularly. So it's a bit different. But it isn't rocket science, and it is different than traditional counseling, though at times it kind of can look like that. Um, What's the difference? It, yeah. Well, you know, the, we're inviting the Lord to do it. We, we have a joke between us, which is if the Lord, the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, we're dead meat. <laughs> because, because we really don't, you know, we're not trained in these things officially. And, and uh, uh, a therapist or uh, psychologist might have a lot of tools that they could use and try to work with people. We're, we're bringing them to the Lord, and, and He's guiding the process and empowering the process, and He's really the one bringing the healing. Yeah, go ahead. Our main job is in response. Hmm. So we will ask the Lord, so Lord, what's going on here? Why, why is this person um, feeling this way? What is all this, for instance, excess anger about? What is that about? Mm -hmm. So the Lord then will, will open up what brought that together. And then we have to move through that. Are there people that need forgiveness mm -hmm. because of the things that they've done? What do you need to, what do you need to own? Mm -hmm. What is your part in it? Um, for myself, I had problems with anger earlier in my life. I was very quick to, ang to become angry. And so one of the things I had to confess to the Lord was I like getting angry. Feels good, right? And you feel so self righteous. Hmm. And and the world tells you, oh, it's okay. Don't keep that anger inside. Anger that's bottled up will give you, you know, all kinds of physical ailments. Huh. So let it rip. Let hmm. it out. Those kinds of things. Those were all lies I was believing, mm -hmm. using, using and excusing my own behavior. So I had to repent of the stuff that I was doing in mm -hmm. relation to the hurt that I had received. Yeah, that's a very good, um, it's, a, it's that process of just going deep into our lives and mm -hmm. identifying those areas that, that need healing from mm -hmm. God. Um, I grew up without a father. Mm -hmm. So that was the big one big for me. One, yeah. I mean, that was how many young people, especially Latinos, yeah. grow up without, I mean, in any culture. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up, so that and the entire piece, I, I had to come, um, and I remember what happened. And I was in a, in a night service, kind of like a prayer service, and I discovered daddy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daddy. I yeah. have never said the word daddy before. Mm -hmm. And um, that that just healed me. So actually, I I it was so interesting to me, you know, that I felt that the Lord um, was my daddy, mm -hmm. and that He was tickling me. <laughs> that was fun. I was like right here. <laughs> um, but but just let me get serious. Um, but yeah, that confession and that identifying those areas. Um, now I have a great relationship with my dad, okay? He's, mm. he's in Honduras. He's a great man. And, mm. and uh, I didn't meet him until I was 15 years old. Yeah. Mm. So that whole process was was very interesting in my personal life as well. Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, I, I got to a point of similar to what you're saying. Um, what are So you mentioned that Jesus is our healer, you know? Mm -hmm. What are the biblical... Uh, foundations um, for um, inner uh, healing and, and healing. Mm -hmm. Back in 1912, a Princeton theologian by the name of B.B. Warfield published an article entitled The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And uh, in that article, he made a, a pretty compelling argument that the primary term used by the gospel writers to describe the internal life of Jesus is what he talked about. That what was going on in Jesus' heart uh, was uh, compassion hmm. when he looked at the biblical evidence. And uh, so when Jesus carried out his ministry, which involved teaching and preaching, healing, delivering, um, he did it in submission to his heavenly Father, who is also characterized by compassion. But he, he, he definitely did it out of compassion for those he met. 
uh, and he expressed it as his compassion in a number of ways. Uh, he forgave those who came and were weighed down by their sins and really just had all that guilt and shame and, and he, he forgave them. And that's very healing to experience that, that weight being lifted from us. Um, by, he, he also accepted those who had been rejected by others and even by their community, like the tax collectors, the sinners, uh, as they're called, the, the lepers, and, and he affirmed their worth as people. Now, that's healing to them. He ministered to people in their grief, and of course, he even sometimes raised the, the one who had died, you know, and he also removed people's shame, and he restored their honor. And I, one, one passage in Luke 7, 36 to 50, really speaks to me. Um, there's this, there's the, uh, this Pharisee who has a, a, a dinner at his house. He hosts the dinner. And Jesus is there. And there's this woman, the Scriptures tell us, that it lived a sinful life mm. is present, right? And uh, she is at his feet. Now, there's an elephant in the room here, hmm. right? Now, Westerners will think immediately the elephant of the room is this woman present and the things she's doing at Jesus' feet. But there's, there's another elephant that I think is even bigger, and that is that when Jesus, in that culture, when you, you're a host, you honor your guests in various ways, and that's expected. It's usual in the culture. It was the same in Indonesia when a guest would come. We say, "Oh, please come in. Please have a seat." Oh, and in a few minutes, the the tea and the cookies would appear, and and then we'd talk a while about family and things, and then we say, "Oh, please," and they say, "Oh, thank you," and then we would talk a while longer, and you and know, two and then hours we, go and by. We say, <laughs> three hours. And we say, and and, Four, and then finally, hours. after about three times, we say, "Oh, please, uh, uh, take, uh, have, have your drink." Tea. And then they drink, and we drink together. And and, you know, those things were expected. They were normal. We did them when guests came, and when we went to their houses, they did it. And it was honoring your guest. And, and these things were expected in this society, too. And, and specifically, uh, first, that there is uh, the washing of the feet. There's water, and uh, that is provided. The second is there's a kiss of greeting. And the third is there's, there's oil for the, the head. And uh, the fact is, uh, so, uh, this Pharisee, Simon, had provided none of those things. Mm. And it was like a slap in the face to Jesus. He dishonored Jesus publicly in front of everything. The honored teacher is there. Okay? And he does this. And, and then there's this woman, and Jesus doesn't reply, uh, it doesn't say anything to his host until the host judges the woman in his heart. And he says, he tells him a parable that indirectly confronts him, and then he confronts him directly. And he elevates this woman, whereas she's been like this, he elevates her uh, in that situation. He says, Simon, you didn't even provide water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting even. She has not stopped kissing my feet. There's, you, you gave me no oil for my head. She poured perfume on my feet. And you, you look at that and you, you see this woman. Jesus does the unthinkable. He attacks his host while in order to lift up this woman. Well, you think that's a healing moment for that woman? A woman who probably, I could imagine, if she'd lived a sinful life, it says in that city, probably men had not treated her well. Mm. And here's a man who, who ex lifts up, restores her honor. And God does is so creative. And the, the point of this is, Jesus did that when He walked the earth. Uh, now He's exalted. He's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's poured out the Holy Spirit and now the risen Jesus continues to express his compassion mm -hmm. in similar ways as we pray, as we bring people to him. And it, it, he's very creative mm -hmm. in these things. 
Very. I, I remember the first time I experienced inner healing, uh, like you, Oscar. Um, I was at a conference, was actually learning about inner healing, and I asked a young man on the, on the ministry team to pray for me. And so he was praying actually about something completely different. It was interesting how the, the Lord worked. So, but he's going on praying about something different, and suddenly I have a vision. Now, I, I come from, you know, Baptist background. You know, Baptists don't have visions, you know. That, yes, that is, that yes is, we do. Oh, oh wow. This I'm is, American this Baptist. Is, uh, this is a, a little different Baptist here. But I She's did at that Baptist. point, see. And, <laughs> and suddenly I see this box on a table in a strange room, and there's a little baby in the box. And I see this man looking at the baby and playing with the baby. And I don't know how I know, but suddenly I knew that baby was me mm. and Jesus was the man. And I saw his face and I saw his eyes, which were full of love. And, I, and, and at one point, the baby kind of grabbed onto his finger uh, as he was playing with it and tickling it. And, and uh, the, his head went back and he just laughed with joy. And it was a very healing moment. And then it stopped. And this guy is still praying on about something else. But, but the Lord met me there. And the weird thing is it immediately occurred to me afterwards, well, of course, I, I was born a month early. I was premature. And I was taken directly from my mother and put in an incubator. And back then, they didn't even let the mother come in the room. And, and so, you know, you're isolated there. And it's there that the Lord chose to meet me, oddly enough. But it was a very healing moment in terms mm. of experiencing God's love. Yeah. Sorry, a little preaching there. No, very good. We need a biblical uh, framework. And mm -hmm. you mentioned some really uh, important compassion. Uh, uh, the, 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 it, it just sounded to me like um, it's, it's a necessary topic for our context today. Mm -hmm. I mean... The world that we're living in, um, the hurt that um, many are, are are going through, the shame that people are experiencing, um, it, it hasn't changed. Um, and um, bodies, individuals, people are walking and are hurting, mm -hmm. are hurting in our churches, in our universities, in everywhere around us. Um, Jesus, um, uh, this this healer the one that has compassion has compassion for you for me for this world um, and he wants our lives um, to be healed to be at peace um, to have shalom to have a state of, of mind and 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 that uh, that's not saying that we're not going to uh, confront things and go yeah. through life and go that's through right. all the but there's a there's an inner peace in in our hearts um, very important what is your perspective on this from a woman perspective? Mm -hmm. I just opened up the whole thing for... I have no idea what to say to that because my perspective is the same as Tom's perspective. We're all about the Holy Spirit doing the work. Mm. I, I sit with a lot of women every week and there's um, some different themes that I see from women. One of them is often that of rejection. Uh, feeling somehow they don't fit in, feeling somehow they're not enough, feeling... Um, that they have to work hard to try to make something of themselves so people will see them and hear them is a very common theme. Um, I, it, uh, another common theme actually that I hear a lot is um, anger with God. And I think that we all experience at different times in our lives disappointment with God. Things did not turn out the way that we thought they were going to turn out. Expectations are not met. Or in other times, deep wounding has taken place and there's a feeling of, God, where were you mm -hmm. in the midst of all this? And so that's some of the most, um, I think most of the, some of the most profound times you're talking about meeting mm -hmm. the Lord in, in that absence of father and seeing him as father. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. I think many women need to see him in the role of protector, defender, mm -hmm. as well as that father figure. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of twirling goes on internally on my couch. I'll often say, well, you know, what's happening? What do you see? Well, I see myself with the Lord. I'm a little girl mm -hmm. and he's holding me or he's twirling with me or mm -hmm. whatever, dancing. Um, so... In terms of, I, I feel like this is something that um, goes well beyond traditional counseling in terms of allowing people to really experience God's presence, mm -hmm. to really understand their identity in Him, mm -hmm. 
to, to receive healing for the, the deep, deep wounds, but also being led to deep repentance. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we tend to look at it in terms of, of a process, and we look at the trauma that we each have in our lives. That's like a rock going into water, right? It creates ripples. Yeah. So when the trauma happens, often it's not even the, the, the event that's the worst part of it, but what we perceive about the event. Oh. Um, so that the rock goes in, and the first thing that we, we have to look at is, how do we interpret this? What do we do with this? Oh. Um, you're talking about being oh. not knowing your father. There are many women I've, I've worked with who mom or dad has left. Sometimes they die. They're not anything they can do yeah. about that. Yeah. But they feel left behind. What do they learn from that? Often, well, I don't know what you learned. Many oh. women will learn there's something wrong with me. Oh. You know, if I had just been good, if I had just done that thing, if I had just gotten straight A's, yeah. maybe he wouldn't have left or she wouldn't have left. Yeah. Yeah? So that's the first thing is what do we learn from that? And then what do we do in response to what we've learned? Mm -hmm. So someone who learned there's something wrong with me, sometimes they'll become a perfectionist. I'm going to get it all right now. No mm -hmm. one will ever leave me again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of thing that we look at and ask the Lord to reveal and then to speak truth to. Very good. Very good. Um, perspective bringing those themes up yes. um, I want to open it up for some questions from you guys um, and and that way we can engage in conversation so uh, who has a question so the thing about listening to the voice it can be difficult to distinguish I think one thing we need to realize is often the voice of God sounds very familiar to us because we've been hearing it but we don't know that it's him the, the, the scripture tells us, that, you know, the sheep know his voice. So sometimes I think people are, are waiting for Morgan Freeman in their head, right? <laughs> this is God telling you. <laughs> right? Yeah. But no, um, we usually ask the questions. Are, first thing we'll say is people say, well, I don't know if this is from God or from me. I'll say, first off, is this something you would normally think? And often the, the answer is no, no. Okay, then I don't think it's you, right? The second thing is, is this thing... Positive or negative? Is this condemning or is this a building? Now, the, the Holy Spirit often, he has to, to correct us. But the voice saying you never get it right, you're, all, you're stupid, you, how could a Christian act like that? That is not the voice of God. It can be your own voice, but most often that's the voice of the enemy. Because what does he want to do? Accuse, condemn, defeat. So, so those are the kind of questions that I ask. What is this voice doing for you? And, and um, is this something that you usually think about or receive in this way? And then you can always also just ask the Holy Spirit, would you speak in a way that is totally clear so that they can understand that this is really from you? You have your oh, own. Oh, yes, I have my own. <laughs> I don't have to ask. Uh, the, the other thing, of course, is we always test it by Scripture exactly. uh, and exactly. then reject it if it doesn't fit. The, one other thing to watch for is does it fit with the situation? By, by that I mean, for example, if we're struggling with somebody whose Christianity is very performance-driven or performance-oriented, okay, it's all about, I'm trying to get it right, you know, I've got to get it, and the Lord has been speaking grace to them, and then all of a sudden we pray and uh, they, they come up and say, uh, well, I think the Lord's saying, I just need to read my Bible more and, and pray more. Uh, uh, because and, and not that those are bad things. How, how can a Biola professor say that? But, but you know, uh, uh, praying and, and reading the word. But that's not w what they needed at that moment. Do you know what I mean? They needed to keep going where we were going, and that was back into their old pattern of okay, I can if I just do some things, it'll be better. Uh, so I think I think that's another question to ask. Great. Um, there was another, yeah, this young man here, and then there was another one back there too. So yeah, please. Well, yeah, I mean, we do see quite a few physical healings. Of course, in the Gospels, physical afflictions are, are healed in two ways. One, they're the, the afflictions that, are, that come from the fall. You can blame it on Adam, okay? We live in a fallen world, and, and disease and sickness is, is a part of life here. Okay. Uh, the second, and of course, what Jesus does there is he does a miracle of healing. And then also there are conditions, uh, seizures, uh, inability to speak and hear, even a case of blindness. 
and some other, uh, the, the bent woman, those are caused by direct demonic oppression. And uh, Jesus deals with that through deliverance. So, you know, we see uh, healing through both sides. Uh, we don't feel we have a gift of physical he healing at all. Uh, there's a gift of healing and miracles mentioned in 1 Corinthians uh, in Paul's discussion, uh, chapter 12. But in, um, uh, we don't feel that, but in the process of inner healing and praying through things, often uh, things happen like that. Thing. There is physical change as well. I'll add a, a, a can, go ahead. After you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no, because probably you're following his line of thought. And I'll yeah, some oh, other, yeah. Other I'm following his line of thought and saying that we pray for healing a lot. Amen. Yeah. And, and we just depend on the Lord to decide what he's going to do with it. And sometimes we see physical healing, sometimes we don't. Yeah, that's a very good answer. Um, <clears throat> because of, well, yeah, in, in my grandmother uh, had this physical healing gift. Mm. Oh, yeah. um, it's a biblical gift. Mm -hmm. um, we will have people from all over Honduras come. Wow. Yeah. Um, she will pray for, for them. Uh, some will get healed, some will not get healed. Um, I, I seen it more in context of um, communities that are up in mountains um, or away, away from um, uh, medical um, resources. Um, and there is no other way but just to pray. Um, um, and, and I've been in that context. And sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, the point, I think, is that we acknowledge it biblically um, and that we discern um, and that we, we were sensitive to what's going on. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, your answers are on that um, as well, because we can we can hurt people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've seen the other extreme where yeah. it's just a manipulation of stuff, oh, yeah. you know. Oh. Um, and then um, I've seen the part that I, I personally have lived um, and, and experience, uh, and so that will change your paradigm. That will change your your the way you see things. Um, I think <laughs> we had um, a hand back there. You guys still want to ask us a question back in the other side? The answer is there is no difference. So this is the way we see it. We were talking about the rock going in the water and the ripples of, that were affected. We see the enemy at work in all of those areas. So the enemy is work in the trauma. The enemy is work in the, the things we learn, which are usually lies. So the deception, he's at work in the things we develop to try to deal with what's hurt us. And so what that means is we do healing with people, and then we follow up with deliverance prayer because we assume that the enemy's at work in there somehow and somewhere. It's kind of like, I don't know if you all have heard of Charles Kraft up at Fuller. For, he, was a, he was a professor there for many years. But he used the illustration of a garbage pile and rats. And the, the hurts that we've received and then our response is the sin that we've uh, developed in response is the garbage. And the demons are like rats that feed on the garbage. So if you're going to get rid of the rats, you just do a little rat catch and they're going to come back because there's still garbage there. So once we clean out the garbage, and, and I want to make it plain that the Lord is cleaning out the garbage. Once the garbage is gone, then we get rid of the rats. There's nothing left for them to feed on. Great. So, yeah, either or thinking is usually a little dangerous because sometimes, it, it, in many cases, it's a mix. Um, but often the background of the person and hearing that, and then as we begin to pray, it becomes clear. Now, some of you may have a biblical gift of discernment of spirits, in which case you might see those things more quickly uh, and discern them. But we, we don't have that particular gift, so we just pray for the Lord to direct us, and, and we listen to their background, and usually those things sort out in the process. Yeah, and, um, uh, yesterday we were talking about you know the the holistic approach to the whole, um, and and this this also means that the resources um, of psychology are available of um, looking at that from that perspective, but also the part of believing and, and also seeking the spiritual peace, um, and sometimes one will take um, you know one direction, other times will be combined. Other times it's a spiritual thing, um, and it would take a while to get there, you know. 
Um, and that's important also, um, you know, to, to have it in the back of our mind because we we pretty much, you, you're helping your friend. You, 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 you're putting this big burden on you to become this expert. And I don't think that's the right, the right approach. It's to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. And, and we want to help our friends and we want to go through this, but also for you to seek out and for you to, um, uh, it, it's very important for one to, to find people that can help us through this, these situations. Um, any other question? We have this young lady over here and then we'll go to you. So the question basically is, you, you see other people who are being used by the Holy Spirit for healing, but you haven't seen that happen in your own life. And so you're wondering if the Holy Spirit has just gifted them differently or, okay. Some people are gifted in that way specifically. Mm -hmm. Are some people specifically gifted that way? Well, well, Paul says, you know, there's a gift of healing is mentioned and miracles, a miraculous work. So there, there are people that are going to, I, I've met some of those and they have a, much higher percentage than than like we do grandmother. when we pray for that, but we still pray, and we have seen quite a few things and been surprised on it. And, <laughs> and I think it's like times. it's like the gift of evangelism. There, there, are, there are evangelists. They cannot even get in a taxi cab in Indonesia without the taxi cab driver becoming a believer as they get out. Right? Oh, they're incredible. You're just like, wait, how do, how did you even start that conversation? Okay. So there are people with a gift of evangelism, but we each as believers are called to evangelize and to share our faith. And so I think that that's how it works with healing or healing prayer or any of the things that we do. Yeah, and I think that brings us to, to an aspect of inner healing is do you have to have a certain giftedness to do it uh, or gift mix? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I know some ministries focus on having the, the gifted person, the person who receives something from God and then brings it to the, the person, uh, they focus on that approach, in which case you would need to be able to do that in order, you know, that kind of thing in order to do inner healing in that context. But we, we focus more on just praying together with the person and, and most often they hear. Now, now we do the times the Lord, we do sense the Lord leading us in certain directions, but, but basically He's showing them, and we really would like them to hear from Him. And uh, then, then I think he, they, they begin to form that openness with Him and that relationship that's uh, really exciting. So, that, yeah, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't think it's, it's so critical to have that gift, but it's really nice if you have some kind of a healing gift. <laughs> that, that would be fun. I I'd just, love that. Yeah, I would just um, add to that, that for you, uh, what was your name? Oh, my name is yeah. Emily. Like nothing is wrong with you or the, the way right. that, you That's know, you, know the, you, you are God's precious creation and is gifted you with different kinds of gifts that mm -hmm. the other friends don't have. Um, so, you know, I would just cautious that, oh man, just cause you know, them praying and the people laying and they're getting healed and all that stuff. So yeah, praise God, keep doing it. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, don't um, stop. and if, if, if God, um, you know, gives me that, bring it to the cross as a bouquet of roses and, and then just say, Lord, thank you, you know, and what's next? And how could I serve you even in these other giftings? That So um, I would just add that uh, uh, to you, you know, and to everyone here. We'll do one more question, and then um, uh, I'll, we'll have um, Kate do some. Yes, please. Okay, the question is, how do we determine whether an illness is caused by j just being a part of the fallen world or whether it's demonically um, based because we can hurt people if we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, we approach it carefully. I think we listen to their whole story, their life story, and you can get clues there. For example, the father in, in that, that account where the boy is brought to Jesus' uh, disciples and they fail, and then he, he, he is called to ask why. Uh, but he's brought and uh, he has... The father says the spirit robbed him of speech. Then Jesus says um, that he addresses the spirit as a deaf and dumb spirit. So presumably addressing the spirit in relation to its work, present work in that boy's life. 
That is he, because when you, when you can't speak, often you, it goes with not being able to hear. Those are often related, and right. it appears to be in this case. Right. And then the father, though, is very aware that uh, this, this is a case of, de- of a demonic uh, illness. How, how does he know? Well, there's clues, and the father picks up on it because he's not closed to these things. See, in the, in the West, including the U.S., Christian, this is this often never makes it on our differential diagnosis that it that, you know, our list of possibilities, uh, things to be eliminated as possibilities that it could be a demonic illness, uh, but the, that fa- his father was from a different culture and so he he says the reason the clue to the father is that the boy often has these seizures that he has when he's near water and fire. And the father observes that and he, takes, he concludes from that that there's a malevolent hand at work trying to destroy his son. Okay? So we're looking for clues. We're, we're listening to their whole story. We're praying, seeking direction from the Lord. Sometimes uh, we have um, simply not been able to conclude exactly what it is and we simply uh, do deliverance. Now, when we do deliverance, it's not something traumatic. It's not something loud and abusive and everything. It, it's something very gentle, but authoritative. And we explain it, and we get you know deal with all of that. And sometimes, you know, when you do that, it can be therapeutic in that there's healing, but it can also be diagnostic. Sometimes it's not clear, but when you challenge a spirit, then you get a reaction and it becomes clear. Now, if it doesn't, then it's okay. We tried that and we've ruled that out. Now it's a matter of prayer and then God, it's in God's hands if He heals that person or not. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.